Hello and welcome to Introduction to Building Technology. This is the first lecture, um, which will give you an introduction to the reasons that we study it, the reason why it's important, and uh, how it fits in with the various other disciplines taught in the school. Um, first of all, we need to kind of figure out what we mean by building technology. And one of the easiest ways to think about this is to break it down into uh, kind of three constituent parts, structure, construction and services. So if we think about structure, um, primarily that's how buildings stay up, what stops them falling down. And that's to do with how loads within the building, the weight of the building, the weight of all the things within the building are transferred down to the ground. With construction, we're really talking about how we might put the building together. The various layers that um, make up a useful wall or a roof to keep the building warm, to keep the building dry, um, to make it comfortable for those within it. And services. Services are the uh, technologies involved within the building that uh, allow us to to use it. So we're talking about heating, lighting, um, renewable technologies and, and such like. And with that in mind, we have to kind of think about why we do these things. Why is it important? One of the prime concerns in building technology, um, and especially uh, since the fire at Grenfell Tower, is safety. Safety of uh, the occupants. And that's partly to do with the technologies that we use to build buildings, but also to do with um, the design of them in terms of how we get people out of the building or how we provide access for firefighting. If we look at Grenfell Tower, um, this is a quote from the, the BBC, I think the numbers have been revised since this point, but it says, in the early hours of 14th of June 2017, uh, a devastating fire engulfed the Grenfell Tower block in North Kensington. The building burned for several hours and 72 people lost their lives. Um, and it's unprecedented in the UK to have a fire that causes that much loss of life. Um, we're not used to seeing these things. We think of ourselves as a very kind of modern, um, uh, civilised nation that's got a handle on fire but clearly we don't and there's been a problem with the technology used in buildings. So why is it important? If we look at that fire and look at it in relation to the to all other fires um, we can see data from Fire Scotland on the total number of fires or the percentages of fires uh, in Scotland between 2015 and 2016. And we can see the vast majority of fires that the fire service attended were dwelling fires. So we've got other building fires, that's uh, you know other, other structures, um, shops, uh, retail, commercial type buildings, road fire, uh, road vehicle fires, that's cars, and then other fires might be fields or forests or such. But over 50% are to do with, with houses, and houses are where, where people live, the people sleep, so there's a greater potential for a loss of life. The other reason that we, we do it, and we're kind of interested in it, is to do with waste. There's a tremendous amount of material goes into building buildings, um, and through the process of, of, of building these houses or building these buildings, a lot of material is, is wasted. Um, again, slightly old data, but it's probably um, still relevant. We can see the breakdown of total waste generation uh, by sector in the UK. And the big blue section down at the bottom is construction. So if you look at 2008 there, um, right up at the top, we've got uh, a little bit there for sewage waste and secondary waste. And then we've got households, so that's the that's everyone living in houses and flats, encouraged to recycle and reduce their waste. But theirs is just a very very small point of, um, or very small proportion of the amount of waste within the UK. Construction waste is is significant. 
The other reason that we look at it is for flooding. Every time we design buildings, we affect rainwater running off uh, of those buildings, and it can have devastating effects. This is Tewkesbury. If we look at 2007, um, there was flooding in Tewkesbury that caused loss of life, destruction of, of people's uh, daily lives, and damage estimated about three billion pounds. And the reason that that happened was that the amount of water running off during storms didn't have uh, the capability of draining into the soil because a lot of front gardens had been paved over. We've got a lot of hard surfaces in our built environment. And what that means is when it rains, water will run off very quickly and go into the drains. If it's in a rural community and you've got fields, then those fields soak up that water and they delay it going into rivers. So therefore it, it kind of mitigates against, against flooding. But in built up environments, we have to be very careful about the amount of rainwater that's running off. It's also important to think about the amount of energy that we use when we're producing buildings. And one of those factors is, is embodied energy. And uh, embodied energy can be thought about the total material, uh, total energy used to uh, develop and use that material. So it's the primary energy consumed. So for, an in, for a material like steel, this could be uh, mining the material, uh, the raw materials, smelting it, um, producing the, the steel uh, components, um, transporting them to site and erecting them. And all those things use energy, either electricity or fuel. And we could say that there's a certain amount of embodied energy within each of those materials. It's a very difficult thing to, to measure. Um, there have been attempts to do so, but uh, none of them um, comprehensively. But each material does have uh, an embodied energy. And that leads us on to sustainability. If we look at the, the, the planet from from the sky, uh, you know, from from, the, from space, we see a lot of water, we see some land, we've got climate there, and part of um, the construction industry responsibility is to try and use materials and use process and energy in a sustainable way so that it can be used and uh, without abusing or overusing any any materials. So from the UN, this statement says, sustainable development is development that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. What that effectively means is we shouldn't be using more than our fair share now and leaving less for future generations um, to, to cope with. And in terms of energy, buildings are actually very big energy users, um, domestic buildings in particular. Um, the only sector that's larger than domestic buildings is, uh, is transport. And you think about the number of cars, planes, buses, trains that go on the, on the road. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're numerous, but a quarter, just over a quarter of the energy used in the UK is uh, used in domestic buildings and if we can build buildings that are more efficient can use electricity or fuel in a more efficient way then that 26 percent can be reduced significantly and part of the cost and part of the the, the implications of um, energy efficient buildings is it can increase the quality of life for occupants if we look at uh, between 2004 and 2009 we had a substantial increase in the cost of electricity, over 75%, and gas, which powers most central heating systems in the UK, um, increased by 122%. And this has an impact on how much money uh, households have to be able to pay for fuel. If wages aren't increasing by the same amount, then a greater proportion of a household income will be used to pay for fuel and we have this statistic here that or this graph that shows us uh, fuel poverty in, uh, in in UK households um, from 1996 when it was at peak falling towards 2003 and then then rising again towards 2009 to reflect those changes 
And um, this is a measure of fuel poverty, and fuel poverty can be thought of as a, an overspend on fuel. The definition at the top of the page is a household is said to be fuel poor if it needs to spend more than 10% of its income on fuel to maintain an adequate level of warmth. There's a couple of things there. 10% of its income is the, the entire income. So that's if there's two earners, then it would be 10% of that whole, whole number. And the other thing is the word adequate. We're not talking about having a, a swelteringly hot house. We're talking about having a house that is heated to the point where we can mitigate against damp and, and cold and keep an environment that, that um, you know, is conducive for family life. The other consideration that we've got to think about in terms of um, building technology is air quality. Um, the way that we construct buildings, the way that we use materials within buildings can have a significant effect on air quality, which can also have a significant effect on our health. If we look at percentages of people that have asthma, um, if we think about buildings built after 1980, they tend to be very airtight. Old buildings have leaky windows, leaky uh, roofs. Um, they're letting a lot of air through. Some of them have chimneys, so there's air moving through there. But buildings after 1980 tend not to have those aspects. So there's more pollutants held in the one place, and that potentially has uh, an impact on those who develop asthma. And worst case scenarios, it's a pretty horrible picture of this, is um, where the air quality is so poor, the ventilation in the building is so poor that we end up getting uh, black mold. And if you if you can't quite figure out what's going on in this this picture, the, the kind of the space in the back is a, a doorway through to a kitchen and the moist air from a kitchen is spilling out, rising up over the ceiling, condensing on the ceiling and allowing mould to grow. This isn't a decorative feature. In terms of how we um, occupy buildings, when we design them, if we don't consider how users use them, we can actually um, limit people's enjoyment or limit people's utility. And one of the key things that uh, we do when we're designing buildings and thinking about the technology involved in them is considering daylight. Um, and daylight is very important because it allows us to um, perceive depth, it allows us to perceive um, colour, um, which are important for, for our, uh, our kind of well-being, but also about how we, we physically move around spaces. Um, a lack of adequate daylight can lead to problems with biological stimulation. Now, each of us has an internal body clock, and if we um, have inadequate daylight, then it can lead to that body clock being running at a kind of irregular pattern. It's a similar thing to having blue lights on mobile phones or tablets late at night. It can interfere with how your body perceives time. And in terms of colour, um, your eyes work in slightly different ways depending on the, 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 the amount of light. As light approaches uh, kind of dusk, if you, if you lower the light levels, our perception of colour changes, and that's because of the kind of physiology in your eyes. Um, and you can test this out. You can walk down a street at night, and the sodium lamps of the street lamp, the orange lamp, um, will stop you seeing colours correctly. Um, the darkness means that you will look at a row of cars and not be able to tell what colour they are because they all become a tonal value. And if we don't allow for adequate daylight with, when we're designing buildings, then um, it, it can have serious problems with how we, how we perceive things. And one of the main things that you probably notice about uh, buildings um, that are either well designed or poorly designed is how well they cope with thermal comfort. Um, you know, we would all be able to sense temperature differences, uh, very slight temperature differences of uh, one or two degrees when walking from one space to the next. Um, but extremes of temperature can cause problems with um, what you uh, what you'd perceive as comfortable. In a room temperature that's close to zero, 
um, our body is, is designed to preserve heat, so it pulls that heat into the core, leaving extremities exposed, um, which means that your hands get very, very cold. Comfortable temperature, which is thought of as uh, room temperature, we sometimes call it, is 20 degrees, which is the middle um, diagram in this, this image. Or at the other end, it's very difficult to get rid of that heat. Uh, we have excessive sweating. So the design of buildings, either through thermal insulation or efficient heating systems, can have a big impact on how we feel when we're occupying them. The other main thing to think about, other than how we sit within buildings or how we occupy buildings, is the importance of building technology in the con construction industry within the um, within the economy, within you know what's what's its importance to the UK. And if we look at two thousand and eleven, um, the GVA for the construction industry in the UK was eighty nine point five billion pounds, which is six point seven percent of it. Now that's quite a, a large percentage for a single sector. There's just over two million people working in UK construction jobs and that accounts for 6.4 percent of all workforce jobs. So as a participant within the UK economy, the construction industry is an important employer but also an important uh, provider of uh, wealth and, and opportunity. So that is your um, initial briefing on uh, building technology. In future lectures, we'll look at specific um, technologies around uh, how we build walls, um, how we service buildings, what uh, structures mean, um, how we deal with the various layers and materials within construction. Um, so you will find lectures like this one on the, the Moodle page. You can watch them at any time and they will feed into the, the workshops that you'll be given.